This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for the suffering, the suffering podcast. 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 An unaddressed problem can quickly turn into an uncontrollable monster. Those demons initially present themselves as innocent or non-threatening. Until one day you wake up and you are outgunned and outmanned to fight a battle against a foe you didn't see coming. Overnight, you are in a seemingly unwinnable war. Rounds are getting thrown at you from all different directions and there is no way you could possibly defend yourself. You are stuck in a foxhole, praying to make it to the next day. Eventually, the bullets stop and the fighting ends. Those who are lucky enough to survive emerge from their shelter with a new life and a different perspective. You come out looking at a different landscape, but you notice every little detail that has gone unrecognized for years. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felice, and welcome to The Suffering Podcast. If you're a fan of overcoming adversity and overcoming suffering, then we're for you, because that's what we do here, and that's the stories that we highlight. So do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, please comment, ring the bell so you can get notified of all of our new content, and now you can join. Follow us on all social media so you can find out what we're up to. On this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we have another friend of Justin Case. We have another friend of another friend. Another friend of another friend. It's how, <laughs> it's how this world goes. He's not a hobo connection, though, is he? And that's the Jersey Mike to talk about the suffering of Jersey Mike. See, I thought this was Jersey Mike subs. <laughs> yeah, he didn't bring us anything. <laughs> no, he didn't bring nothing. They got Jeez. great gluten-free rolls, too. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Really I appreciate it, because you went down this whole journey right now that we're going to get into. Nearly cost you your life. That's yeah. right. Before we get into anything, let's throw a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody as police, but we do trust them. So go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. Your father's still running. My father's still well, I don't <laughs> know. We're going to do a weekly update Mr. on my father. <laughs> Mr. Felace check on whether his car is still running. You know, I talk to him all the time, but I haven't seen him. <laughs> so I don't know if he's still driving or not. His car may be wrapped around a tree, and I don't know yet. Maybe he's afraid to tell you. <laughs> yeah, so, play. so Mike. Hey, Mike, I need another car. Could you call yeah. a guy for Toyota? <laughs> so, Mike, each week we take a question from our audience. This week's question comes from Sticky Fingers. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Did we just have this conversation before? <laughs> <laughs> that love the, I love the names on social media. It says, what is your life's motto? So if at the end of your journey... You're going to be known for something. What would you like to be known for? What would be your motto <clears throat> after you move on? Uh, probably this tattoo I got after getting sick that says, more life, more love. That's, um, that's not bad. Yeah. It's deep. That's not bad. Because that's all I'm looking for after uh, my near-death experience. You know, you're, you're moving. You, we all got an expiration date, right? That's right. You're moving through and... And then, but life is one thing, but if you don't have the love, what's the point? But you don't, we don't know our expiration date, so it's like we don't have a countdown. It's a guessing game. Yeah, we have It's that. a guessing game. Mike, what do you think? Mike Felace. So we're going to have to go Jersey Mike, Mike, and it's just regular Mike. So you're just Jersey Mike. That's cool. We'll just call him Jersey. <laughs> Jersey. <laughs> you know, like, it's, I mean, you, you know what it's like to come, both of you know what it's like to come close to, to dying. I vowed the day of my incident. To live every day like it's fourth and goal. I'm going to go for it. If I want to do something, I'm going to do it. I'm not dying to live. I'm living to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to take everything out of every day. I don't want to go through life with regrets. I don't want to go through life with what ifs. I want to go through life with I dids. Could you hurry that process up? <laughs> <laughs> and listen, it's not too far away to believe. But, <laughs> you know, I, I recently had a conversation with somebody, and if you had... A 15-minute layover in an airport with anybody. How would you spend that 15 minutes? Would Frank Sinatra. You, Frank, 15-minute layover. What would you do? <laughs> would, you, would you talk to him? Would you hug? Would you embrace? Would you make love? What would you do? You know, you only have 15 minutes. And if you lived your life like you, you were in a 15-minute layover, you know, life would be pretty good. Yeah. Would. So my, my life's motto is a little different. Uh... Coming out of the darkness, coming out of the place where I was, I believe that there is hope, you know, and without hope, it's, it's really a wasted life. But I am strongly tied to this notion that there is post-traumatic success. Um, whatever your trauma is, you use that trauma and you flip it on its ear. Rather than keeping you down, it actually elevates you and lifts you up. 
sounds like you did that, Mike. You did that very well. You took your incident, and before, where it was a detriment to you for a short time, you got through it, you moved on, and now you'd lead with that. So I lead, first time Mike walked into group therapy, I said, that Kevin, shallow look on my face. Yeah, I said, Kevin Donaldson, landscaper. I didn't want anybody to know I was a cop because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed how I was asking. I was embarrassed that I was too weak to, to understand what was going on with me. Now, and I was always afraid people to tell, tell, tell people that I was a police officer because I was 39 years old when I retired. And they're going to, the inevitable question, what, did you get home when you were 12? Well, no, I was in a shooting and I really went through some bad times and I never told anybody that. Now, I'm 49, so it's a little bit different. I am of the age where I can retire. I said, no, I'm a retired police officer. Um, well, why'd you retire so early? Well, I was in a police shooting and it took me down a bad path. I had to retire. It wasn't my choice. So I'm a strong believer that there is post-traumatic stress. Uh, <laughs> post-traumatic go. success. <laughs> so Sticky Fingers, thank you so much for sending that in. Keep sending in your questions, and we will try to get them on the air. You know what Sticky Fingers was? It was a... Rapper. Ro- no, it was a Rolling Stones oh. tribute band back in the day. Sticky Fingers? Sticky Fingers. Because yeah. Rolling Stones have a song called Sticky Fingers. I don't <laughs> think I've ever heard that Rolling Stones. I'm not a big Rolling Stones fan. That's not my thing. I don't know. Mick Jagger well, up there looking like he's got cerebral palsy. You're only 49, so, her, yeah. so before your generation. <laughs> they were only 20 years older than me. <laughs> so anyway. So, Mike, you traveled all this way. Um, I've I've read a lot about your backstory from your good friend Justin, he's told me all about you. He said, you got to talk to this guy. He's the guy. And when somebody we, we trust tells refers us someone, to refer somebody, our ears perk up. And then I did some research into you, and, man, you had a hell of a journey, man. I am uh, I'm very thankful that, you know, we spoke on the phone for a little bit. I think you were at work. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you, I don't know how open you could be. But we're going to get into it. So why don't you tell our audience? I know enough about you. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in here in Jersey, in Kearney. Hopefully, like Kearney, hopefully it know, fits. It fits your name. Fits the name. Did you go to Kearney High School? I did. Did you really? <clears throat> I went to five high schools. <laughs> I went to three in uh, three in Jersey and two in Florida, causing trouble jumping around. My five mother high pulling schools. me out of schools and stuff. Um, That's enough right there. We yeah. could end the show with that. I went to five, the suffering of five high schools. Five high schools. Five high schools. Four, Four teachers. Yeah. I love being the new kid. <laughs> I went. You get you to meet, reinvent yourself. That's you meet right. more friends. That's right. More friends and reinvent yourself. Let everything that you fucked up go. Nobody <laughs> so, knows. Did you ever see that movie, The New Guy? <laughs> so the new guy that's the greatest movie in the world and yeah. i tell my kids that all the time i'm like yeah when you go to a new school when you go to college you can be anything you want to be that's right nobody really knows you if you unless you go to school locally nobody knows who you are nobody knows where you've been or what you've done or what you've said if you said something stupid it's gone you that's can right. reinvent yourself yeah, i was born and raised right next door i was born and raised in north arlington oh man i'm that's, right there at the border right on route seven like oh, really? right, right by the bubble pike the, yeah. Yeah. Yep. the only thing i know in Kearney is piper's cove it's the only thing yeah. it's some it's some I mean, scottish i don't even know if it's still there yeah that's well a... you got the scots club you got piper's cove right. you got all those different it, it's same thing like like crudell down in harrison Kearney. harrison has a bar like every block Kearney on the harrison end has a bar every block yeah then they start. So you, you, I know you came from immigrant, an immigrant father. Yeah. Where did he come from? He came from Portugal. Portugal and yep. uh, bringing Portuguese values over. Yeah, Portuguese values mixed. Portuguese with work ethic. Work ethic, and then also mixed with, uh, I guess, what was going on at that time in the eighties and nineties. You know, my dad did construction. It was a, a different kind of life. He Your father was Portuguese and did. did did construction? Yeah, that's, Jeez, that's very that's, that's very strange. odd. Strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just for everybody's knowledge, every laborer on every union construction crew is Portuguese. That's right. Is Portuguese. Yeah. And we had this whole conversation before. That's why we we're bringing it up. My my dad was a, a union bridge painter, and um, did his work. Um, I don't know. I guess the way it was done back then, guys would go to work, and it was very systematic with the bar. I rarely saw my father. It, you know, if I caught him, it was maybe on a weekend at like 11, 12, him getting up and and headed out. Wow. Uh, for the most part, on the weekdays, he'd be getting home 12, 1 o'clock, 2 in the morning. Getting up at 5 to go to work. Yeah, yeah he'd maybe get three, four hours of sleep. Some nights not come home. 
You know, it's it's amazing that you're in the construction industry now, and your father was in the construction industry. Um, what I know about first generation immigrants is they never want their children to follow in their footsteps. They work their ass off so their children don't have to. Was that ever was that ever put into you? Don't follow me. Do your own thing. Go to college. Be smart. Be be a good person. Um, yeah, then his father realized he went to five high schools, and he's a college. Is that yeah. <laughs> uh, my my mom used to instill that in me, but um, my dad's just a quiet person. He was very like disconnected from uh, kind of engaging with me. He didn't have really much of a relationship with his father, and his way of showing love was just kind of providing. You know, like throwing money at the situation. Here's the house. Here's the things that you guys need. You got your mom. You got your grandma. Your sister. You guys are good. Figure it out. Uh, this is this is everything I got. Did you ever try to connect with him? Yeah, you did. Yeah, multiple times. And what what was the what was the response? Uh, he was just too busy. He was too busy doing his own thing. I think he 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 felt like he was doing the best he can. And you know, now that I'm older, I look back. I know he was. Is he is he still with us? Yeah, he's still with us. Yeah. And and have you ever gone back and revisited that? Yeah, I have. Um, he's just not very vocal about his emotions and and feelings he's he's a very very quiet guy i'm gonna give you the best portuguese story and his son is actually a police officer in the town that i work in so he was a laborer all right and i didn't think the guy spoke english no. i'm telling you i didn't think he spoke he didn't speak one word well they were cleaning up the road after after the day and two girls drive by in a convertible and there was dust everywhere and the girls start yapping all of a sudden he's pushing the broom he's pushing the broom and he goes Shut up, lesbians. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. And the cop I'm standing with goes, holy shit, he speaks English. And the cop just goes, just keep moving, keep moving. It's <laughs> the greatest story ever. But um, they're hardworking people. They, they, they love the opportunity in this country from what I know of them. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure working 15 hours a day wasn't their idea of the American dream. No. Yeah. But they but they work their asses off. That's what we want in this country. Yeah. You know, we don't we don't want these people that are living off the system. We want people that want to come here and actually love the country and work their ass off for this country. Well, did you think your father he just that was his that was his love language? That was his love language, yep. It's just providing. Just stuff. providing. And um he, he doesn't know how to like read or write in English. He dropped out of school in sixth grade when he got over here and went right to work. And that was, you know, that was his thing, was work and being out there. He enjoyed it. You know, I mean, there's a lot to say for someone like that, though. They they did the best they could, like you said. But how did it rear its head in your youth? And, you, you know, fatherless, you're basically fatherless. Yeah. You have a father, but you're fatherless. Yeah. Uh, how did it rear its head? You said you were in five high schools, so I don't think it turned out too well. No, it didn't. I, I'd say right around... You know, puberty, 13, seventh grade. Girl, um, girls got you in trouble. There you go. Nah, <laughs> I mean, kind of. But <laughs> but right off the bat at that time, um, because of the lifestyle my dad had, kind of being at bars every day, not coming home, my mom kind of got fed up with his shit and was like, we're going to move and go to Florida. They had a house out in Florida. And he stayed in New Jersey working, and they stayed together in a relationship, but we went to Florida. And... um that's when I kind of, uh, you know, even his lack of presence in, in Jersey was very little. But when we got to Florida, he was, he was gone. That's the that definition of fatherless at that point. Yeah. You know, so, he's living in a different state. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I, I, I was looking for uh, a male figure, you know, to, to bond with at that time. And, and I didn't have one. So I kind of uh, was upset about moving. And I started to rebel at a, at a really young age. I started to... Uh, imitate a lot of things that I saw, you know, growing up. My dad would get mad about bills and shit, start breaking shit in the house, and then I'd start doing that at 13 when I was frustrated, punching holes in walls and all that kind of shit. And, uh, you know, ass whoopings didn't work very much anymore. When I hit puberty, my mom, you know, she she did her best. She tried. She tried her best, and she did well till I, I was just too big. You know, she couldn't really control me anymore. It's first time your mother punches you. Or hit you in the arm, or hit you with a spoon, or a stick, or broomstick, or something, and you laugh. Yeah, you know, like, that's that's when you realize this doesn't hurt anymore. That's when you look at the look on your mother's face, like, oh, oh it's it's over. I'm done. It's over. Mm -hmm. 
And then what are you going to do as a parent? Like, you're a parent now. Yeah. What do you do as a parent when your kid no longer... Because there is a healthy amount of fear. I'm not saying you got to beat the shit out of your kids. I don't even hit my kids. But there's a healthy amount of respectful fear. Yeah. And once that's gone, now what? Now how do you control them? Yeah. You go, what are you going to say? You're not going to... Well, you're not going to do that. You say, well, you're not going to eat. So yeah. what did your mother do? She tried communication uh talking to me you know um my mom was very very engaged and very loving all the time um we had a really good relationship just out of the the issues she would have with my dad she would always like come crying to me about the things going on with them and so we we, we had a like a big bond she probably like overcompensated with you for the love that she didn't have with her husband yeah you know now she she brought that love on to her children yeah 100 percent, and um was she Portuguese as well? Uh, Brazilian. Brazilian? Yeah. Ooh. At least she wasn't Puerto Rican, right, Andrew? Mm. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Ooh, Brazilian. Yeah. They're tough, they're tough people. So yeah. you come from good stock, like good yeah, tough no stock. Um, and then what was some of the ways that you rebelled? I started looking for trouble. Um, I, I started to kind of mask my fear with aggression. You know, I, I, I was a scared kid in a new environment and the way I kind of looked at things was, you know, if, if I overcompensated, um, you could hide it. Yeah. Or is or it, if really, I, or was it like make a name for yourself? Like he's a badass, you know, we're not going to fuck with this guy. Uh, both, you know, I, I was kind of, um, all, all the love and compassion my mom had instilled in me growing up. I was like, I'm done with this shit. Yeah. I don't need to get it off of me. So let me go look for some problems, uh, to try to burn this shit off of me. I need to get, you know, a little more aggressive, more wild. And I started looking for problems. To, now, now, to make later, that happen. now later in life, thinking about that, isn't that just such a weird concept, you know, I'm going to go look for trouble. Oh well, yeah. yeah. So the overcompensation thing I get, cause Males will do this to this day. They'll overcompensate. They'll tell you how many women they slept with, or they'll get a brand new car, usually a sports car. They overcompensate because they're hiding something. They're, they're, there's a hole in them that they're trying to fill. That's right. Penis, cops, penis envy? Yeah. Well, <laughs> cops, do it, cops do it all the time. You know, what's a cop do? You know, he, he goes out when he's dissatisfied with his job or his life. He's got a hole inside him. He goes out and gets a girlfriend. And when that doesn't work, he tries to get promoted. And that doesn't work. And it just, it's, an, it's a vicious cycle yeah. until they find something to fill that hole. Um, but eventually they, they do overcompensate. So what are some of the, your overcompensation? What You said you got aggressive. Fights? Yeah, I was a quiet kid. You know, I was quiet. I didn't look. It's not like I was looking for problems. But when they came, I always, you know, blew up and overcompensated in, in, in that way. Um, Eighth grade, I started drinking the end of that year um, and went from a drastic place in Florida of drinking to cocaine, like, really fast. You, really. you went right from, wow, you went, you went hard. Yeah, it was Florida. It was Jump. like, Coke was like the, you know, it was like smoke a joint. And it was like, hey, there's Coke. And, it, you know, Florida, we were doing it young. It was everywhere. <laughs> and then you never sleep and you can be more productive and... And you could yeah. drink, and you could drink more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could drink more. Like uh, I was never a fan of alcohol at that age. I hated the fucking taste. I hated the way it made me feel. I I used to be at parties, kind of. I do blow and like dump the alcohol out in the fucking bathroom, <laughs> and leave my beer can somewhere, and just enjoy being coked up. You know, it's fun. My my father used to say, "I hate." cocaine i just like the smell of it <laughs> <laughs> my father she, coming from him that's funny where where is this cocaine coming from you're in eighth grade you don't have the money for coke and you're talking mid 80s right uh no this this was i was i was born in 84 so this holy was, shit this was like uh, yeah, i graduated 90, high school in 84 yeah this might have been like 90 97 98 oh wow so you're not time. even getting like good george young coke or anything like that <laughs> i don't know it was it was Seems pretty good back then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, <laughs> you're only 13. Anything feels good. Hey, yeah. I so, mean. Do you know who George Young was? No. So, George, do you ever see the movie Blow with uh, yeah. Johnny Depp? Yeah. By the way, totally misleading title. I watched the whole damn thing and not, none of that, by the way. So, I just want to, you know, same thing when I watched the movie Snatch. <laughs> it, it was just fighting. But. Um, there was that movie Boobs, too, and it yeah. had nothing in it. Nothing. Um, 
but that movie Blow, George Young, he he controlled, I think, at one point, like 75% of the cocaine that came into the U.S. And then, you know, he just fell apart. But, you know, where I'm trying to figure out where in the late 90s the cocaine, I guess it was, was uh, Escobar? No, Escobar was killed in the early 90s, right? I think so. Pablo early Escobar, 90s, yeah. I believe, was killed in the early 90s. So you might be getting some El Chapo stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Came straight out of Portugal. <laughs> I'll tell you what, when I finally got to New Jersey, the shit here sucked. <laughs> it was a little better there. Yeah, you're, tell, was, you're telling me. <laughs> it was filled with baby formula and, and all sorts of different byproducts. So cocaine, cocaine's your thing. So tell me something wild that happened. The key component to any law enforcement officer being the best version of themselves is through education. Sherry Alsop is a leader in providing that education to police agencies, preparing them for the all too frequent dealings with sexual assault victims. You've seen Sherry on episode 169 of the Suffering Podcast. She survived incest and almost daily sexual assault, so she comes from a place of experience and true understanding. Sherry has the intelligence, commitment, and compassion to open the eyes of those on the front lines while providing the tools to effectively deal with a difficult situation. Sherry's instruction comes from experience and multiple certifications. Training with Sherry will offer on-site training, customized schedules, specialized instruction, tailored from a victim's perspective. You are going to hear Sherry's heart-wrenching but inspiring survivor story. Learn proprietary trauma-informed training techniques, uncovered victim-centered interview methods while earning continuing education credits according to your state guidelines. To be the best, you must learn from the best. Let Sherry also guide you through the delicate cases of sexual assault from a victim's point of view. Be a source of comfort to those victims affected by these traumatic experiences while producing a solid investigation and uncovering details that often go unnoticed. To find out more or to contact Sherry Alsop, go to SherryAlsop.com. That's S-H-E-R-R-I-E-A-L-L-S-U-P.com. So I got put out of one high school. Uh, freshman year, I was going to this place, uh, Flagler, Palm Coast High School, and I got pulled out of there. My mom was like, you're done going over here. I was getting in trouble, partying, doing all that shit. She'd find me with, like, bags of blow coming in the house in my sock. Um, and she's like, I'm going to put you in a Catholic school in Daytona Beach. And she's like... Uh, your mom yeah. didn't know. That's a bad move. It was right a bad, it was the worst fucking move she could have made. Now, now you're asking where the coke came from? The yeah. priest. Okay. <laughs> that, that was a bad move. But she thought in her head, she's like, I'm going to put you in this Catholic school in Daytona Beach and get you away from all these kids. And um, when I got there, now I was around kids with money. Had a lot exactly. more money than the ones in the public school. And I realized that fast. And... Um, I was best friends with this kid, Josh, at the time. He was like the all-star little quarterback. It was our sophomore year. And it was an old hotel made into a Catholic school. So all the kids would leave their backpacks out in this locker area that was kind of outside. Um, and at lunchtime, we'd go through everyone's backpacks and take whatever we fucking could. We'd just pretend it was our backpack. Go to the locker, grab it, go to the bathroom, take shit out. Um, one day one of Josh's friends saw me going through his girlfriend's backpack and freaked the fuck out. We got in a fist fight there. I got sent home, expelled. I mean, I uh, was suspended. And I went on AOL and this kid hit me up on AOL talking shit and I was talking shit back. And I'm like, you know what, motherfucker, I'm going to kill you. When I see you, I'm going to kill you. All the shit that was going back and forth. And this was a little bit after Columbine. Ooh. Um, so after I wrote that in an instant message to him, uh, he had apparently printed it out and sent it to the school. <clears throat> and uh, the fucking feds show up at my door in like SWAT gear. It was like a SWAT team showed up and all geared up, guns, uh, helmets and vests and shit banging on the door. And I was watching Boy Meets World with my sister. <laughs> Had no fucking idea what was about to happen. And they stormed through the house uh, and Baker acted me because I made a threat to kill another kid online. Because when I went to high school, and I'm sure it's, I mean, I told a lot of people I was going to kill them. I didn't mean it, fit, yeah. didn't mean it uh, verbatim. But we, Same didn't, thing. we didn't have, we didn't have internet back then. Right. Uh, so uh, it was yeah. like, I'm going to kill you, motherfucker. That's how, that's how I said it. I'm going to beat your ass. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But after Columbine, so I remember Columbine very well. Yeah. And things changed. Like, you're like, we, I had never heard of anything like that. Yeah. I never heard of Columbine well, back then. 
you, you remember when Columbine first happened? You're like, kids did what? Yeah. It was it was the most insane thing in the world to me. Yeah. Because we grew up saying we we're going to kill you. Yeah. Young, I'll yeah. kill you. I'll kill you, motherfucker. Yeah. You know? But now they take it literally. Now, are you getting in juvie? No, they brought me to a, a, to be mentally evaluated at a Daytona Beach Mental, like, a, you know, for psych ward facility. Um, they brought me there. They kept me there, I believe, like five days to be evaluated. And when I got out of there, my mother was so fucking embarrassed after what happened. She's like, we're out of here. You're not going to school here no more. We're out of here. And uh, we came back to New Jersey. So those those were two high schools in Florida. Um, but now you get a chance to reinvent yourself and yeah. leave behind your past yeah. transgressions. 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 It, except for me at that time, that was kind of like uh, I was building on that. I didn't want to reinvent myself. That was, you know. But it's a new beginning in a new place. You could do the same thing, and you're. It looks like you're just starting off again. That's right. That's right. Fresh start. Yeah. <laughs> so you came back up to Jersey. Yeah, I came back up to Jersey, and um, I always had good grades. There was a deal between me and my mom. You want to go out, you got to have good grades. And he, he, even though my mom couldn't beat my ass anymore, I still would would produce these grades for her. Uh, you know, to keep her okay with me being out. So it wasn't always fighting and. Um, I still continue to to party, look for shit, look for trouble. You know, got in little things with uh, selling drugs and and just experimenting and anything I could get my hands on with some kind of trouble. I was always, you know. Did you go down like the crime road, like any burglaries, stuff like that? No thefts, no robberies, nothing like that. No. Just... So you you experiment with all different type of drugs. Yeah. So from your experience. What do what do you find is the the worst one the worst uh, high the high aside what's the worst one you feel that you've tried alcohol really yeah and I I need to know why you believe that because it's backed by society it's it, it's 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 pushed it's accepted by, it's pushed by society it's pushed accepted <clears throat> and. Um, you know, almost looked at as odd sometimes if 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 you're not partaking or can't partake uh, with it. So, um, with that being said, I feel like with alcohol, you can really push out your time and how long you can stay and dabble in that addiction. Whereas some other heavier drugs, you know, you have to hide it. You have to fight all these different little things that make it kind of harder to do. And, you know, being drunk and being an alcoholic is, even being a functioning alcoholic is pretty accepted in society. You, you can go to a liquor store, you can't go to a Coke store. But that's, that, right. that's a good point. You go to any party in the world, take a beer and a couple lines of Coke. Somebody watches you do a couple lines of Coke, they're like, what the, what the fuck? fuck is going on? But the beer, hey, you got another one? Yeah. They'll ask you for for one for themselves. So that's a it's an interesting perspective, and I never even thought of it that way. Yeah, it's a drug that 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 you know you can look at somebody and say you know what are you trying to hide with that or why why are you taking this? And Just a little offshoot. What do you think about the this this the new marijuana laws? I feel like even with marijuana, it never played a massive destruction in my life, other than. Being a gateway drug, I feel like. I mean, but alcohol was for me, too. It was like they were both kind of minor league, you know, things to do before you got into the big boy shit, like Coke and uh, everything else that's on the table. Ecstasy was back then. Um, Nobody ever started heroin with heroin. Right. That's, you know, that, that's, that's the truth. And you know where I heard that is Breaking Bad. Yeah. Right, so he's he thinks the 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 kids on drugs, and he takes them to a crack house or something. He goes because they found marijuana or they found marijuana somewhere. And he's like, none of these people ever started out. It was crystal meth. No, none, none of these people ever started out doing crystal meth. They always started out with alcohol, and then it went to marijuana, yep. and then it went here. Yeah, right. And it's like these little things. There, they might seem little, but they are coping mechanisms. You yeah. know, they're 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 all steps into young kids at least myself i was learning how to use this to cope because it was fun at first let's party let's have a great time this and that but then when it came to now i feel like shit i just want to have a drink yeah. or i want to have a smoke or, or whatever the case may be um when i got into coping with things that's when shit started getting fucked up yeah. it's your new norm at that point you know like you said it's a coping mechanism 
you know, and, and that's, that's where I believe the addiction comes in. If you're feeling a certain way, you have a drink, right? A couple of days later, you're feeling a certain, that certain way again. What are you going to do? You're going to resort to going and having a drink. Right. Well, that's, uh, so my problem with the marijuana laws, and I, I don't have a problem with marijuana per se. I have a problem with, it's oh, not, yes, you did. it's not, <laughs> it's not he- healing anything. So these people who, I, I hear this a lot, oh, I need marijuana to function, I need marijuana to function. No, all you're doing is masking whatever the real problem is. And, and it's making you functional, but it's still not solving the problem. Same, same thing with alcohol. It's yeah. the same exact thing. And that's my problem with it. And I'm not ragging on anybody that, that does marijuana. You do you and I do me. But I just don't see the value in legalizing it. Oh, I see the value in legalizing it because it's a financial thing. Financial thing. And yeah. then it's also something I think that, you know, another thing that's a controlled substance that is known that people cope with. So it's like when, when the government might take that into their ball game now, you know, it's like... Well, that's what I said. You said it's a controlled substance. Now it's a governmentally controlled substance. There you go. You know? Which is <clears> even dangerous. And soon it's other things coming, like mushrooms and MDMA, everything else that big farmers trying to get their hands on because right. people are going after holistic shit now. Nobody wants to, to be taking Prozac every fucking day. So now they're playing with all kinds of... Um, you know, hallucinogens and, and uh, ketamine and all these different kinds of therapies that, you know, the government's putting their hands on, too. To the, the ketamine shots, the MDMA. MDMA, I hear, is going to be legal within the year for pharma- for medical, medicinal use. Right. Uh, and then I think it's within five years, psilocybin's going to be yeah. legal. Pretty soon, uh, I know, like, somebody like Jesse Ventura is a big proponent of make all drugs legal. Because, and he's got a point, and I get the point. The point is... An addict or somebody who's using those substances is going to find it anyway. Well, let's give them an avenue in order to find... If they're going to get it anyway, let's at least give them cleaner stuff, not laced with fentanyl or cut 7,000 times. I don't know if that's a good thing. I, I don't know. Like, I don't really have an opinion on that, but I understand but you're, you're still going to have the illegal market, though. Just like marijuana. Yep. The illegal Actually, market is still there. Yeah. Yep. You know, the, this, uh, this whole thing, the, this legalization thing... It hasn't because it's expensive and the stuff on the streets cheaper, but you're gambling, you're gambling. Did that ever cross your mind when you were, when you were in your, your drugs, when you were doing the, these multiple types of drugs that you're going to get something dirty? I didn't give a fuck. I was actually like more excited about whatever it could be. I was not scared at all. I, I, I wanted whatever you know, crazy shit I could get into. And if we died, we died. That's how, like, me and my, my friends would roll or my cousin. We'd be like, if if we fucking die, then fuck it. Like, See, like, you know, <laughs> and that's what's so crazy about today. You could get free Narcan. Yeah. At, at a, at a, uh, uh, a pharmacy. Pharmacy, yeah. And they have commercials on it. I heard a commercial the other day. It's like, oh, I heard, uh, like, Susie OD'd the other day, and someone gave her Narcan and, and saved her life. Like, what are we, what are we yeah. teaching these kids today? It's yeah. okay. It's okay to do cocaine and heroin as long as you have some Narcan on you. Well, so do you, there's there's there'll be a group of people that do heroin. I've just recently heard this. There'll be a group of people that do heroin. Say there, there's a group of five people. One person will sit out and hold the Narcan. Right. So if anybody ODs, they shoot them with Narcan and bring them back to life. The fucking world is crazy. It's nuts. Yeah. It's nuts. Oh, well, you know, you always use a spotter. Yeah. That's what I heard. De- uh, designated driver. Designated yeah. Narcan. So you move on, you're, you're starting to progress. Yeah. Uh, what's the drinking like at this point? Uh, it's like here, here and there. I drink at parties. Um, the taste but, start to get better? Uh, yeah, taste started to get better. Right into like Jersey Shore days, prom, Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day, all that shit. And so I'm going down and we're at Seaside and, you know, the beer's tasting better. All the alcohol is starting to taste better. And the girls are looking better. The girls are looking better. <laughs> All that kind of stuff's going on. And, and alcohol is starting to kind of make its way to the forefront of my uh, the things I cope with. You might be f- the first person I ever heard of that actually put drugs in the background, yeah. in the rear view, and then made alcohol. It was probably easier uh, to get. I, I also, my, my grandfather died from cirrhosis, so I mean... I don't know how they talk about genetics or however it might be, but when, when things started to work and click, um, 
for me with alcohol, it was like I would drink and get more energy at that point when I, it, it, I'd feel like a blast of fucking adrenaline when I would drink. So it started to kind of have this weird effect that when I was younger, it, it was like the opposite. I used to drink and become dizzy. Now I'm 17 drinking and I'm a madman, full of fucking energy running down the boardwalk in Seaside, you know. <laughs> Looking to fight garbage yeah. cans if I had to. Yeah, <laughs> you know, fight garbage cans if I have to. <laughs> and what? And what's what's your drink? Is it just beer or is it anything you get your hands anything on? Anything I get my hands on, anything we could have at the party. You know, we'd rent houses back then, like 30 of us in one house. Keep the deposit because we're going to fuck this place up. And <laughs> <laughs> nobody's want, nobody wants it back, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Not, You're not going to be as back to rent next year. Yeah, we will not be back. You'll never blacklisted on the, <laughs> the rental market. Yeah. You just put that in the cost of doing business. <laughs> But you, you're you're getting close to high school graduation. You yeah. Gotta figure out kind of what you're gonna do for work. What's what's your plan at this point? I uh, got try to go to college. You know, try to go to college. I, I graduated, started at community college, and my my parents gave me like a cushion. You know, they were like, if if you want to take a break, they would, they always gave me a home. So I kind of uh, decided to take that break, and I'm like, I'll be back. I did, I did school for a semester, and I said I'd come back, and I ended up just going to party, mm. just going to party party more. But how were you making money? I wasn't. Oh. They, were, they, were funding your, they were funding your habit? No, nah, it was like a little stupid shit to kind of make money. Like uh, at that time, buying ounces, buying ounces of weed, you'd be able to flip that, and it would be enough to, to make your money back on some things, like little shit like that. Uh, was was enough to get by, and also from my mom giving me some money. She also helped me, you know, gas money, things like that. Wow. Now, did did she know everything that was going on with you? She did all the drinking and the drugs. She did. Everything? Yeah, it was something that, like, you know, uh, for the most part, at that age, I was doing it at home because it was more accepted. My mom was better off. Like, hey, do it here. It's better than you going out there to the fucking clubs. I don't know if you're yeah. gonna die and not come back. And that was that was her her logic, you know. Do it here. I can see you. You do it out there. I'm here praying for you with a rosary all night. So, ultra Catholic. Yeah, that's yeah. what to do. It's not really like an enabler, though. If it's your mother, I mean, she's really just looking out for you. Her intentions were good, yeah. but um, there's a lot of parents who will give their kids drug money, especially heroin addicts. They'll give their kids money so they don't steal. Yeah, yeah, and they don't go to jail. They'd rather have their kids in their house than in jail. Yeah. yeah. So, but you owe your mother an apology. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a, a lifetime full of them, you know. But also at that time, um, like we had a basement. I had a whole little studio set up. And a lot of times I'd have people over. They would bring things bring things over. So it was like my house was the kind of party house. Yeah. And if I was having five, ten people over, they were bringing drugs. They were bringing alcohol. They were bringing everything. My spot was kind of like. You know, your parents did that by design. Yeah, yeah. They, to keep you in the house. To keep me in the house yeah. safe. They could watch and. You know, I'm you're going to do it here or you're going to do it out there. You might as well do it here. Do it here. And yeah. that, that was the, the way of thinking. Yeah. So when did you start to notice it got out of control? Um, I had a cousin that passed away um, in 06. That, that's when I, I went from drinking a lot to just fucking binge drinking. Like I, I became a full-blown alcoholic. I was drinking every day, non-coherent. Waking up, drinking for breakfast. That's kind of how I dealt with, um, you know, losing, losing, losing him. It, it's, um, it's cool when it starts. And I, I've said this before on the show. I was watching an interview with George Carlin. And George Carlin's talking to John Stewart about, some, about drinking and drugs. And he goes, in the beginning, drugs and alcohol, 99% fun. By the time you end, it's like 1% fun. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's, it's funny how that just seesaws like that. When it becomes a problem, it's no longer fun. It's no longer fun when you start needing it. You know, and I don't like to be dependent on anything. And now you're dependent on alcohol. And how old are you about at this time? Oh, so, so you're, what, 22 in yeah, 2006? Yeah, around that. Yeah. Um, it, it took full control of me. Like, I, I, I didn't want to think about the death, so I just wanted to be blacked out. Numb yourself. Yeah, I wanted to numb myself. Um and I did that for a good, like, six months to a year. I was in this throwing up every day, blacking out phase every single fucking day. That's, that's kind of where I was, just aren't stuck. Your, aren't your friends saying, hey, Mike, what are you doing, man? Nah, 
a lot of them were would come by and just be scared of the situation, you know, like uh some would hang around, some wouldn't want to be around me anymore cuz I'd get drunk and start shit, you know, uh, uh, uh a lot of them kind of hung around because I had the place. I had the open spot to 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 hang around, but nobody was uh, coming at me to, to, you know, hey, relax. I think you need to relax. And if they did, I'd probably tell them to go fuck themselves too and get the fuck out of my face. You know, but that becomes almost like your identity, you know? You're it, Mike the drinker. Mike, That's a, yeah, Mike, it, Mike the drunk. Yeah, you know? and, they, and they, they, expect, they expect it from you at some point. They were expecting it. They'd come over and they'd maybe, maybe be like 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning and i have a bottle of vodka out and it was expected. They were like, oh, shit, Mike's already starting. It, 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 was, it was expected. Plus, you almost become the go-to guy. Hey, you want a couple drinks? Let's go to Mike's house. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how it was. Very the, well said. You're still, at this point, are you still doing any drugs? Uh, yeah, I was yeah. doing whatever people would bring by. It was ecstasy, coke. The only thing I never did was heroin. I, I could never put a needle in myself. I, I didn't have the courage. Um, it, it, that I couldn't get to. But everything else that was coming by, I was always always down for. And how long did this go on for? Uh, probably till like, about like 24, 25. That went on. And did you notice any type of physical problems from this binge drinking? Yeah, I threw. I was throwing up bile sometimes. You know, I, I noticed this odd yellow shit that would come out of me. I'd throw up, and I told my mom about it. She was like, your liver's getting fucked up. And I'm like, what are you, crazy? I'm in my 20s. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. This can't be me. Can't be me. Too you know? young for I'm this. Too young for this shit. And and I was I always thought, I'm like, I didn't drink enough when I was in my teens. I was always doing too many drugs back then. I'm like, I got plenty of fucking liver to fuck with. So <laughs> I got at least 10 more years of this shit. <laughs> my other organs are screwed, but my liver's fine, Mom. Yeah. Well, what was the, what was the first, aside from the bio? What was the first sign of real trouble? Uh, the withdrawal effects in the morning, I would feel. That was like uh, I'd wake up out of breath, um, shaking, shaking hands, sweating profusely. And I knew the only thing that would make that go away was Another a drink, drink in the morning. DTs. Yeah. And then you're, you're at this point, you're, you're just drinking to stay even. Yeah. I'm drinking to stay even and find a comfortable place where I'm, I'm, I'm conscious and not blacked out. And how long did you find that eventually? Uh, no. I'd lose, I'd, lo I'd lose it every fucking night. It, 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 no, I never found it. <laughs> There's got to be a look in the mirror. There's got to be a, a moment when you look in the mirror and go, what the hell? What is going on? Not me. I'd like, look in the mirror and be like, fuck it, let's go more. Let's go harder. Let's go harder. No come to Jesus moment? Nope. Now you start getting into, you're, you're starting to order on 30. You're, you're moving up. There's there's some physical things that happen to you. What's the first sign of some something starting to shut down in your body? At 26, I had a bit of a saving grace. That was when my first son was born, and uh, I met the mother of my kids, and she she drank as well, and we we drank a lot together. It, it, the relationship worked because of the drinking. A lot of other women would come into my life, hang around for a little bit and be like, what the fuck is going on here? I'm a, I need to run. And this person didn't. So it like, I was like, wow, someone who's not running away from seeing me drink vodka at six in the morning. They must love the real me. It was like, Hey, you accept me for who I am. So this is, this is the way that I am. And you know, um, we kind of built this, whatever you want to call it, relationship drinking together that uh, resulted in her getting pregnant with my first son. Alcohol's that cause. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. You didn't name your kid Budweiser, did you? No. <laughs> Tequila. <laughs> Tequila. Tequila. Pop off, vodka. Pop -off. A fucking... <laughs> Give me a little pop off. <laughs> so you go on and, and you're still with this girl for a while and now you start having some health issues, some real serious health issues. What was the first science? Believe it or not, I had... I had no health issues um, until 35. So you're hitting it hard for 35. So from the time you're 13, for 20 years, 22 years, you're hitting it hard. Drugs, alcohol, everything you can ingest. You get your father now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if kids don't straighten you out, there's, there's, there's a big problem. There, there was a small little window when my son was going to be born that I was sober, that I gave up alcohol. I went to like a retreat and I, I, I stopped drinking for a year. 
And after that year, I started working, got my life together, started going in construction, non-union. And at that point, drugs fell out of the picture because my career depended on being clean. And um, alcohol really started to to play a, a major role because I was sober and I'm like, okay, well, I got my alcohol I can go back to. And I didn't look at it. I was like, I got my life together now. I have a structure here. I got a job. I have a son. Um, it's time to barbecue, beer, let's go. And um, that's where I started to, to go in that direction. And uh, it was pretty fast that I was back into binging. You know, I'd go work, come home. You take... turn it into your father. Yeah, exactly. Without the bars. Because yeah. it really was, I, I wasn't like a bar guy. I wouldn't go to work and go to the bar. I'd come home and have my drink there. I wanted to be around my kids. Because mm -hmm. my dad wasn't around. The one thing I was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking be present. I'm going to be seen every day. I'm going to be home with a drink. So in a lot of ways, you <laughs> fell into the generational curse, but you also broke the generational yeah, curse. Yeah. Like, <laughs> one, yeah. one and lost one at the same time. <laughs> isn't, isn't construction like a breeding ground for alcohol, though? It is. It is. I... I you know, I, I used to work with a lot of uh, Spanish guys, and, man, they could hit it hard. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, could they hit it hard. You know, oh, you're yeah. talking Honduras, Guatemalan, Mexican. Mm -hmm. And so there's two ways those guys go. It's they hit it hard and do about every bad thing that you possibly can think of, and or they find Jesus. And then once they find Jesus, they're good. Yeah. They're good. But it takes – they got to go through one to get to the other. That's really Jesus, isn't it, to yeah. those guys? Yeah, find Jesus. <laughs> find Jesus. <laughs> So I, I hate myself sometimes. <laughs> so at 35, what happens? Uh, 35, the, the relationship with the mother of my kids completely started to fall apart. And um, there was infidelity there. And the only thing kind of holding me up in some functioning alcoholic kind of uh, nature was my family. You know, I had this family that I still had to somewhat keep myself together for and when that when the cheating happened i was like fuck now i don't have shit now this is all fuck cheating and on her end or your end her end her end <clears throat> oh wow um and i was like i can't go back from this I, I i i was just fucked up from it so uh when that happened i just really went down a spiral like really 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 bad uh, I almost felt like I, I lost everything. And I thought on top of losing my family, I'm like, well, now, even though we weren't married um, at that time, she was like, yeah, we've been together more than 10 years. And even though we were not married, <clears throat> we technically are. And all this shit's mine, the fucking house, all of this shit. So you, you better fucking get ready. Get the fuck out of here. I'm taking everything. And, you know, I was I was scared shitless. I, I thought. She, she was going to take everything, my, my fucking soul, my life, my house, my kids, Your everything. kids. Everything. Your kids, yeah. I mean, you're, you, I, New Jersey is a common law state, so it's possible. Yeah. It's, 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 although it's, there's some gray area in there. What's it, seven or nine years? To it's consider ten years, I thought years. it was, but mm. I don't know. Well, it turned out it's not. No, it's not. It's not. Pennsylvania is a common law state, and she fucked up on her Google research, so it's not. <laughs> Okay, good. Good. Good for you. <laughs> I didn't know at the time, but I was I was shitting myself, you know, like I I just felt like I lost everything. I felt like everything that this this little bit of glue I had holding shit together just just fell apart. And so you're hitting it hard and you're starting to have some problems with your liver. Yeah. Um I was drinking drinking a lot, about liter, liter and a half of vodka every day. Every day. Um still functioning. I was going to work, and at work, things got to a point one day where I was nodding out in the, in the machine, and I called my super over. I'm like, I can't be here anymore. I'm like, I'm going to fucking end up killing somebody here. I got to go home. I need, I need a break. And my super knew my situation going on with my separation and everything else, and I was like, I need time. Let me go home, get myself together, and I'll be back. And I, I had weaned myself off alcohol many times before, um, but this time, I couldn't do it. I, I, I took off and I went home to go deeper and deeper into a drink more. So, so you left the job because you wanted to quit drinking, but you went home and drank. went the other way and went, yeah. drank even more. Even more. Even but, more so. So then you fall into some serious medical issues. Yeah, the biggest, the, the biggest first sign I had um, where I, I broke out with these like welts all over my body, like hives. Felt like an allergic reaction almost, but I had welts on my head, on my my 
whole entire body. Some of them, uh, you know, this big, they were huge. Um, and I knew in, in the back of my head, I knew it was from the alcohol. I mean, there was no way. But then, of course, I, I get on my phone. I start Googling shit. The worst thing ever. Yeah. To do. And uh, I'm like, oh, well, man, this might just be a reaction to something. Let me take a Benadryl and have a shot of vodka. And then the wallets went away. And I was like, okay, um, I'm good. And um, kept drinking every day. And then I'd say a couple of weeks later, I couldn't pee anymore. I wasn't drinking water. It wasn't like I was hydrating myself here. Like, let me have shots of vodka and make sure I get hydrated at the same time. I wasn't going to the bathroom. I wasn't eating. And my stomach was swelling incredibly fast oh, you're getting like the beer extended the, the beer gut uh it, and it was called uh uh ascites or ascites it's it, it it's um basically you start to build up fluid vial within your stomach cavity your liver's not processing things and these fluids start to build up in your in your stomach all the bile's got to go somewhere and it wasn't coming out i wasn't peeing i wasn't shitting um and i just started to swell and swell and swell more until uh, one day I woke up and I went to look in the mirror and my eyes were highlighter yellow. Yeah. And it was one night to the next. Well, you had joined us. There's a picture on your Instagram yeah. of that. And it's it's scary. I mean, it's it's yellow as that spam doll right there. Yeah. Yellow as Big Bird. Yeah. That's actually, that's what the mother of my kids called me when she saw my eyes. She was like, damn, Big Bird, you really fucked up, huh? Wow. <laughs> so you got to be scared shitless to go to a doctor. Yeah, I didn't want to. I, I was absolutely. I, I when I saw my eyes, I fell to the ground. I was like, "Get the fuck out of here!" Like I, I almost collapsed in in fear. I, I couldn't breathe right. I started hyperventilating. I started to play with the fucking lights. Maybe it's the fucking lights in this goddamn room. Changed the light bulb like four times, um, and I was not gonna go to a doctor. I I ordered. I went on Amazon and I ordered some liver support pills, and ordered some milk thistle and a little remedy of shit I could get together. Started drinking some water, and I, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to start weaning off. Time to, to wean off. Maybe my eyes are yellow because I'm dehydrated, is what I thought. <laughs> Even though I knew. But I fucking yeah. knew. What took you, what, what point made you go to the doctor? I didn't. I didn't. Um, my son found me barely breathing in our guest room. Uh, my mom had noticed that I hadn't been on Facebook. Uh, she saw that I hadn't logged on. I wasn't active. And she called my son to, to check on me, like, where's your father? My mom knew kind of what was going on, but she didn't know how bad it was. And when my son went to go find me, I was in the room barely breathing, unconscious. And he tried to give me the phone. I, I didn't have really enough energy to talk. And my mom said, I'm calling the, fucking, calling the fucking police right now. And my mom called an ambulance to come get me. And uh, when they got there, I started to become a little more coherent. As a matter of fact, I got mad because they were trying to take me. I, I told them to get the fuck away from me. They were like, listen, you're dying. Not. They're like, do you know who the president is? I named the wrong president. Um, and they're like, you have to come with us. And I'm like, you're not fucking taking me anywhere. I'm fine. Get the fuck out of my house. And the one guy like pulled me to the side. He's like, I promise you, you're dying. If you stay, you're going to die. And he convinced me um, to go with them. And I started vomiting blood everywhere. It was like... Uh, black coffee grounds yeah, oh that means oh god uh, yeah it you was like upper gi blue <clears throat> yeah. yeah it was black coffee grounds everywhere and uh they rushed me to the hospital and put me in a uh, uh induced coma right away so i didn't go into cardiac arrest how long were you in the induced coma uh, almost three weeks don't remember a thing i i was i went for a ride while i was asleep yeah would you <laughs> would you what do you remember uh a lot um very like out of body shit you know um i remember feeling like uh i kept looking for it felt like i was walking around the hospital it felt like i i was looking for a drink and anything i would drink or take down wouldn't satiate any kind of yearning that i had i felt like trapped in this kind of purgatory that i couldn't get out of um it's exactly where you were and that's exactly yeah, you were in purgatory. Like, you were in purgatory. <laughs> you're in a holding cell. Yeah, that's that's what it felt like. And it, it, it felt like every door I opened, I was back into the same place uh, again, trying to have a drink that did nothing for me. So after three weeks, they pull you out of the coma. Mm -hmm. What's your first thought? I'm hungry and thirsty. I was so fucking thirsty, man, because they had this tube down my throat. Like a, my tongue felt like the, like a, 
like a lizard skin. Uh, it, it, I was so dehydrated. And after getting um, some ice cubes they gave me because I couldn't just drink something right away, then I saw the looks on the people in my family all looking at me. And I couldn't get up. I couldn't walk. Um, it was really hard to even lift my hands. All my limbs wouldn't move. Nothing was really moving. And I was like, wow, I fucked up. Did you feel like you let them down? Uh, yeah, I felt. I want. I saw. I felt like I let my kids down. Yep. I felt heartbroken. I, I was. I was crying like a baby. I was crying like I was, you know, five years old. Everybody that I saw. What was the diagnosis? Um, acute liver failure, um, kidney failure, uh, respiratory failure. Um, brother, you shut down your whole body. Yeah, no good. Hepatic encephalopathy. And um, diverticulitis, I had a hole in my intestine yeah. at that time from, from all of that shit. Um, and the pneumonia buildup in my body was, was in, in, incredible. Like, my skin was yellow. Every, everything was yellow and swollen. My feet were, looked like elephant feet. They were huge. I was 270 pounds when I woke up. Wow. Wow. I was this big balloon. If that's not going to wake you up, yeah. nothing will. Now, what did they say the long-term effects of your liver are at this point? Did they, or did they think you're going to need a new one? At that time, yeah. They were like, so in the state of New Jersey, you can't qualify for, I mean, you can't apply for a liver transplant unless you've been clean six months. So they're like, first, you can't have a drop of alcohol in your system just to get on the list. And they're like, we don't think you're going to make it to that. So let's see what happens. But there was a, another hepatologist that had a different perspective for me and she was just so positive and so like caring and she's like you shouldn't be alive and you just being alive and stabilized and your liver is just not getting worse where before it just kept going downhill she's like just take that and be grateful and you're gonna be okay you're gonna live a long life and she wasn't going by any kind of medical report she was just going by her experience and seeing people come in and die from from liver failure from alcohol well, she, she was trying to give you some hope yeah yeah she sold it to me well, I, good I took it and ran <laughs> she, you, she sold your hope <laughs> she did fuck the dope she, i finally got sold some hope <laughs> yeah so at some so you get out of the hospital sometime eventually you're released mm-hmm I mean, you, three days later, because this was COVID just landed. Oh, Ouch. COVID had just landed. And they're like, you got to get out of here or else you're going to die from COVID. We're going to send you home to recover. And uh, they sent me home with a pick line in my arm. And I had to do like uh, this, uh, these intravenous uh, treatments, uh, IV infusions four times a day. You have a second shot at life at this point, And you're still unsure about any type of long-term damage. When did you start actually feeling a little bit better and coming out of this little fog, this funk? Uh, like two months later, my eyes turned white, which they said might take up two, three years. They said might never turn white again. But two months later, my eyes, my eyes turned white. And that's, when, that's when you sold your self-hope now. Yeah. You, know, you're, you, you look like you're getting better, so it's like, hey, maybe there is something out there. Yeah. Now, at this point, are you thinking in your head your drinking days are over? I, at that time, I was thinking my drinking days are over. I mean, when I got home from the hospital, the first night I laid on my couch, I spoke with God, and I said, you know, please, if you can give me more time here with my kids, I'm never going to have a drink again. And, you know, I was in full desperation uh, at that time. You signed on the dotted line, so. I did. Yeah. Now it's time, and, now it's time to carry through with the deal. Except at that time, I, I didn't. Further later, I had more more issues i'd say like maybe a total of like four or five months after my my coma i went to the doctor the same hepatologist that that sold me that hope and she's like your liver is in as normal as anybody else's liver if i run your i ran blood on your liver and it comes up i could never tell that this happened to you by looking at your blood now and at that time the mother of my kids had moved out. She had left the kids behind with me. And I was in this 
lonely place of like being stuck at home because COVID, where I started like looking to socialize and and date, try to meet women again and intermingle in, in that place. I hadn't been to any kind of rehab or AA. I hadn't given myself any kind of uh, recovery resources. I hadn't taken any. There were some offered to, offered to me, but because of COVID and all the things that were going on, I was still just subjected to, to be at home. And going back out and socializing, I felt like I, I, I didn't have another way to kind of socialize. And I said, I'm gonna have a drink. Ooh. And I did. Ooh. Even after all of that. Alcohol is such a powerful, powerful a, a drink. drink. No, more than a drink. It, it, <laughs> let's just say that when I, the same the same way I had that conversation with God and I saw it on the dotted line, I, it was a night by myself that I went out and I bought a bottle and I looked at it and stared at it for hours, walking back and forth to it, sweating bullets about what I'm about to do. And I'm like, can I even have a drink? What's going to happen after this drink? Can I get drunk? What's what what what's going to happen here? And I had I had another conversation with God and, and I took a shot. And then I took another one, and I almost like, I could taste, it. it's almost like a metal taste in the back of your mouth that is also like a sign that your liver's not doing well. It kind of tastes like you got copper, like you got a penny in your mouth, some weird shit. Like a Wilson's disease type of thing. Yeah, and um, when I tasted that, I was like, fuck. I'm like, maybe it's not, <laughs> maybe I'm not in the clear, but I... I was still in an unhealthy mental place, uh, like mentally, of where I was at. I, I, I was still lost. And I ended up calling one of my buddies at that time. And I was like, everything in New Jersey was shut down. And mind you, I had come out of like a 10-year relationship. My, my mom was in Florida. And I was like, you want to take a trip to Florida and just go try to have some fun? I'm like, I can't be in this house anymore. And he went with me, and we went down there and, uh, like, partied. It was, like, spring break. And I did that for, like, about a month. Um, trying to make it fun. Like, trying to, trying to enjoy myself. Um, the, only way know, the only way you know how. The only way I knew how. And um, when I got back from that trip, and I get back home, I continued to drinking. And I was at a hotel in New York that I was partying at. I started going out by myself. I couldn't go out with anybody because nobody that knew me actually wanted to go out and have a drink with me. They were like, fuck, I'm going to come drink with this fucking guy. He just was dying six months ago. Um, and there was a night I was drinking that I got sick really fucking bad. I was just nonstop puking. I couldn't hold anything down. It was like... It was like I was brought back to that day with the yellow eyes, and I, I kind of collapsed on the ground, and I, I knew. I was like, you're, you're going right back where you came from. You're going to go right back into the fucking emergency room. This time you're going to die. And I tried to, like, dabble with this idea of moderation for a while. I stopped the partying at that time, and I went home and cut the partying out. And tried to dabble in moderation. If I go out to dinner, I can have a glass of wine, glass of wine, wine, have a drink. And I'd still have my nights where I'd want to go in and keep drinking, you know. Um, it wasn't until August 23rd, 2022, that summer, I had an uncle pass away. And my diverticulitis came back to haunt me. And, like, bad. It hurts like hell. I know. Really, really bad. And this time when it came, they're like, we have to do a, like a, a very major surgery on you. We need to remove part of your large colon. Put a, put a bag in you? They didn't. I ended up not needing a bag, but they thought that that was part of the deal that was coming at me. Well, they, did, they probably did like a resectioning where they cut a piece out and put it back together. Put it back together. And they were like, you might still need the bag, all of this stuff. But um, that was the fucking worst recovery that that was horrible and i kind of had like an epiphany moment at that time that if in no way shape or form was i going to live a long life if i continued drinking even in moderation like i i was i was gonna i didn't have a lot of time i already knew that 
isn't God an amazing thing? Yeah. <laughs> because they'll they'll give you some they'll give you more chances than any it, it, it'll give you more chances than anything else in the world. It'll yeah. give you it'll give you enough rope to hang yourself to. There you go. You that's, can, like, that's the fucking truth. <laughs> you can fuck up a thousand times. And God'll still take you back. I'll still take you back. I'll still take you back. When was it over? August twenty third, twenty twenty two. And since then, you've been good. Six hundred and ten days. God bless. What have you replaced it with? Because no addict ever just drops alcohol and doesn't pick anything else up. Yeah. Red Bull. <laughs> Red Bull's one. <laughs> I, I I I always liked Red Bull, but yeah, Red Bull's. Yeah, one. but you used like vodka and Red Bull. Yeah. yeah. Now it's just straight Red Bull. Now it's just straight Red Bull. I'd say I've replaced it with. Learning to grow comfortable in my own skin. And I feel like my my social media has helped with that. Sharing my story has helped with that. Putting myself out there and not being ashamed anymore. It, when, when you said earlier, like, you know, post-traumatic success, I stopped looking at this shit like this was something wrong that happened to me. And, and I really started to embrace that I was given a gift. It's work, okay? It's a four-letter word that none of us like to say. Work. Yeah. That's what this is. Staying sober is work. It I'm is. sure there are moments. You, you go out, you see your friends having a good time, having a couple drinks, socially drinking like normal people do, but you're not normal. And you look at them and you're like, oh, man, you know, it would be good. It would be nice just to tie it on one more time. But then you remember what it was like and all that, all those deals that you made. Then you... And, and alcoholics and addicts are real good at making deals. Yeah. You know, we're we're salesmen all the time. Well, you know, I can just do it this one time. I can do this. I can do this. But now you have an opportunity. With what you went through and your story, you now have the ability to help other people. So I know you're doing some pretty great things now with your story, aside from your social media. I know you're hooked up with Justin, with Addicts with Voice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a pretty one. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Justin started up Addicts, Addicts with the Voice, and um, he asked me if I wanted to be a part of it, share my story with it. We we spent a lot of time talking where he shared what he had going on. Can you understand him with that Georgia accent? Yeah, it's tough. He's he's got a wild <laughs> yeah. a wild story behind him. Um, but with Justin Addicts, Addicts with the Voice, sober motivation. A lot of these different platforms started to really help me be able to connect with others and share my story. Um, but it also gives you something concrete that you can anchor yourself with. All yeah. right. So when you want to go drink, no, 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 this is more important. I got to, I got to, I got to anchor myself to hearing rather than anchor myself to alcohol, which is unsustainable. Yeah. You know, for me, the biggest thing I think I've replaced the addiction with is my clarity. Like being able to understand and process what's going on around me. Before I was always trying to run, get numb, and and now I really want to stay. I, I, it's I a good enjoy, place. I, it's a good place. I enjoy knowing what's going on. Like I, if I'm out now and everybody's having their drinks and stuff, the last thing I want to do is not know what's going on. It's it's so nice to be able to know what's going on, and also. There's nothing better than kind of, for me, growing comfortable in my own skin. I was always very shy. I used to drink just to be able to talk. I wouldn't have people over unless I'd have, be able to drink. That's how, you know, I, I, uncomfortable I was in my own skin. And little by little, being sober has made me, like, start to rebuild a relationship with myself, consciously reinvent myself into something I'm proud of rather than something I'm fucking hiding from or running away from all the time. You'll never be all, all right in this world if you're not all right with yourself. That's right. Yeah. You can't love anybody else unless they love yourself, too. This is true. And, it, and that's <clears throat> it, it's so much work to be at peace with yourself and not bullshit yourself. Like well, the, you can't bullshit yourself. The scary <laughs> thing is, is okay, so you have 613 days? 610. 610. 610. Okay, 610 days sober, and everybody thinks, well... Jersey Mike's got it all together. He knows He knows the secret. Uh, little do they know, you don't, all right? Anybody who advocates for anything, don't ever make the mistake that they have it all together. That's right. They just, they're just a little further along in the journey. 
They got a couple more tools in the toolbox. That's pretty much all it is. And, uh, you know, if you were to fall, and <clears throat> I hope you never do again, people have to understand that this is my journey. This is, this is how, and I will pick myself up and I will do it all over again if I have to. Right. Um, so that vulnerability is big. So, but why don't you tell our audience where they can find you? I know you, you're big on Instagram. Yeah. Um, why don't you tell everybody your Instagram? Instagram, Jersey Mike with a Z, J-E-R-Z-E-Y, Mike. That's it. That's, that's it. it. That's you got it. any other social media? Uh, same thing on Facebook, TikTok. It's all Jersey Mike. It's all Jersey yeah, Mike. it's and, all Jersey Mike. And Addicts with Voice, is, is the website up yet? Yeah, yeah it is. It is? Okay. It is up. Yep. All right. So I was just talking to Justin yesterday. Yeah, it's me too. Me too. <laughs> I was telling him you were coming in. Um, Mike, this is an incredible journey that you took where – you got pulled out of the depths so many times. You suffered. You threw yourself into the. You threw yourself into the depths so many times. That's and pulled right. yourself out. You know, you willingly jumped into the fire, <clears throat> um, but you've suffered. But that suffering has taught you something. So we're coming to the end of this thing now, and we always end the, the every episode the same way. There was always lessons in suffering. So why don't you tell everybody what your suffering has taught you? It's my biggest gift in life, man. It, it you know, my my biggest suffering and, and things I went through in my adult years that my kids watched. All this that I thought I was such a victim to and to blaming everybody for just really put me in a place to realize it felt like God was just giving me a gift. Take this realize this take this gift this isn't your suffering this this is a gift for me and i realized today that it, it was the best thing that ever happened to me you know alongside having my kids was was this suffering is it, it brought me to where i'm at today and and i feel like people need to embrace that you 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 can't run from it you know you you kind of got to hug your demons and and make them your friends and that's been the biggest blessing on my journey was this gift. Because if I didn't get to the point where I did, maybe I'd still be trucking along in some half-assed functioning alcoholic life, which I didn't want anymore. Andrew, cut that promo for the Suffering Podcast. Mike just said it perfect, mm -hmm. just so you know. Okay, <laughs> make sure we cut that. Mike, I can't thank you so much for thank coming you. in. That's a great story, man. You're, you're a tough guy. You really are. Thank you, guys. Just no more yellow eyes. <laughs> no yeah. more yellow eyes. No more big bird. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast, the Suffering of Jersey Mike with Mike Faria. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned. Fathers show love in different ways. Overcompensation can hide many holes. Drugs and alcohol are coping mechanisms. You owe your parents an apology. <laughs> Okay. Uh, suffering is a gift, but most importantly, more life, more love. That's right. And while everybody's at it, I want you to go to 234 Franklin Avenue in Nutley. Go visit Gus at Cubita Cafe. Sit down, tell them the Suffering Podcast sent you. Great food made by a top, sh top shelf chef. Uh, follow us on all social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Clapper. Red tube. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to go to popple.com, get your digital business card, put in the code TSP20 for a 20% discount. And of course, follow Mike at Mike underscore Felace. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. And we're going to see you on the next episode.